So, um, up till now, you kind of had the basic science of anti-infectives. Uh, this was the price you paid. This was the basic pharmacology aspects. Now, from my perspective, this is the good stuff I'm about to go over. Uh, <coughs> this is actually using the antibiotics, what are good choices in specific diseases. Okay, Th this is very similar to a, a presentation I would give to a practitioner group. Okay, <coughs> and this is, is based on empiric therapy. Now, if you're not familiar with the term, empiric therapy means based on prior experience. It's a little bit um, broader than that. It's basically everything other than you have in an individual culture and susceptibility. So it's prior experience, it's expert opinion, it's uh, historical culture and susceptibility results, all the things that go into uh, making your best choice for an antibiotic without having the individual culture and sensitivity result. And this one will be on small animals. I'll do a, a separate one for cattle and for horses. So uh, here are selection criteria. You don't realize it, but these are the steps that you're, you'll go through or you should go through when you're picking an antibiotic. All right. Does the diagnosis warrant antibiotic therapy? Now you'd say, well, that's self-evident. Well, remember, kennel cough, Bordetella, is self-limiting typically. So we don't really need antibiotics unless it's progressing into a pneumonia. So is that warranted? <coughs> what organisms are involved? Okay. Uh, <coughs> one of the things uh, you'll get a handle on is uh, the usual etiologies associated with specific infections. And this is an important point, and too many practitioners don't make that leap. They connect an antibiotic with the disease. So I'm treating pyoderma, I'm treating cystitis. What you want to eventually get to is I'm treating a pyoderma due to staph intermedius. I'm treating a cystitis due to E. coli. So you need to have an idea of the organisms involved. And yes, you can do this empirically. Now, the, I'll show you in the next slide, there are cases where just about anything could be there. So we have to use four quadrant. But for other things, we kind of have an idea while culture and uh, sensitivity is pending. So if you know the organism, the whole reason I've been taking you know, through all those d um, damned charts that you hate so much uh, is that you would know the probable susceptibility. This is not replacing culture and, and sensitivity testing. This is uh, while you're waiting to get those results back or perhaps uh, you do it in certain cases, you don't need a culture and sensitivity. We'll talk about that. Uh, what region of the body and the cell is the organism located? Is it behind a tissue barrier? Is it inside a uh, phagocyte or is it extracellular? And if it's in across a barrier, will the antibiotic penetrate? Okay, if it's intracellular, does it burst and release where it can be uh, affected? Are there any things in the local environment? You, know, you should know those antibiotics that have trouble in purulent debris. Doesn't mean we can't use them, but uh, we should try to drain those areas if we can. We may use more aggressive dosing in those situations. Uh, when we have multiple formulations, which formulation and which dosage regime is likely to be effective uh, and for how long? What are the side effects, toxicity risks? Um, and if it's a food animal, does it pose a residue problem? And of course, always in veterinary medicine is the most cost-effective treatment. Now, the things that I've shown in red are the things that I think people forget about. Again, organism involved, they tend to treat the disease tissue and they forget what organism uh, may be causing it. And oftentimes that varies. They forget about penetration. All right, I've got to cross the blood prostate barrier. I've got to enter the milk. I've got to cross the blood brain barrier. And they forget about those local environments that inactivate. 
Okay, so all of these things go into uh, selecting the most appropriate antimicrobial. Now, again, certain diseases, you kind of know what it is, all right. Bordetella, um, kennel cough in dogs, Bordetella bronchoseptica, pink eye in cattle, Morix elbovis, uh, strangles in horses, strep equi, these sorts of things. <coughs> uh, but we have those conditions where we have really an unknown etiology or a mixed etiology. And here are some of those that we deal with. Peritonitis, septic pleuritis, endocarditis, all of the things listed here often have unknown etiologies or mixed etiologies. And when you don't know what you're dealing with, there is no substitute for culture and sensitivity. Yes, it has its limitations, but if you had to pick one single thing that predicts clinical success, that would be it. Culture and susceptibility. All right. And it costs you up front, but oftentimes it saves you money in the long run. Uh, practitioners I've run into, you know, they don't want to spend the 30 to $50 to run the culture and sensitivity. <coughs> and that's fine as long as they guess correctly on their empiric therapy. But if not, then they still have to do the culture and sensitivity and, oh, by the way, the animals uh, worsened in the last week. Okay. But also, sometimes, uh, most of these things, a lot of these things, again, mixed infections, you have to use four quadrant coverage. So this tends to be a lot, um, uh, very commonly, of our, our broad spectrum or combination products. So we may be using more drugs and more expensive drugs than we really need to. Okay. I, I got a uh, urine, urine culture and susceptibility from an intern yesterday, and it was susceptible, uh, it was an E. coli susceptible to both clavamox and amoxicillin. And she was on clavamox, okay, which wasn't a bad choice to start with. But she doesn't have to be. You can just use amoxicillin. It's a lot cheaper, uh, and actually it's better tolerated. We see more anorexia and GI disturbances with clavamox than we do amoxicillin. So it can save you money. Remember, a lot of these things have anaerobic components. A lot of what I've listed up here will have anaerobes. And anaerobes typically are uh, in mixed infections. You'll see anaerobes with facultative anaerobes and aerobes. Okay. Now you have your pure anaerobes like Clostridia that can cause disease, but usually your Bacteroides, your Fusobacter, your Peptostreptococcus, these sorts of things are more commonly in mixed infections. All right. Uh, but for a lot of these things, we have to start with four quadrant coverage. And I showed you this before. Uh, again, four quadrant coverage just means it covers most of your gram positive and gram negative aerobes, facultative anaerobes, and obligate anaerobes. It does not address your special spectra. So four quadrant does not imply antipseudomonal activity or uh, anti-enterococcal activity, those sorts of special spectra. But uh, oftentimes, uh, you will use a lot of uh, four-quadrant coverage, at least initially, okay? And then hopefully you'll get culture and susceptibility results back uh, to let you uh, tailor that down to the best drug. So what are some of the four common four quadrants that you can use. Uh, a lot of uh, people on routine things like wounds particularly, uh, clavamox as the oral or unison as the injectable. Again, this is uh, amoxicillin clavulanic acid or ampicillin sulbactam, basically the same thing. They're gonna get all of these things, uh, including B. fragilis and the anaerobes. Now you notice I've got E. coli kind of uh, uh, in outline form because here's where the, the probability of susceptibility dips down. Uh, not a lot of our enterics are susceptible, so that's the one drawback. And cefoxetin is a second generation cephalosporin, as is cefotetin, that gets our anaerobes and B. fragilis. It's the only cephalosporins that do. 
uh, but again, they lose out on the enteric somewhat. So these are good in, in wounds, and uh, if you're looking for uh, a four quadrant, but it's not a life-threatening sort of scenario while you're uh, getting culture and susceptibility, then you have that. Uh, another one is chloramphenicol. Not so much routine because uh, a lot of practitioners don't like owners handling the chloramphenicol because of the aplastic anemia issue. And remember, that's non-dose dependent. So small amounts of chloramphenicol in the genetically predisposed human can be an issue. But I, I, I think you can certainly send this home with clients with proper uh, client education about wearing gloves and washing hands. But it's really a good drug, and it's one um, like you say, uh, I've been doing this for a while, and I've seen kind of, kind of rising trends and failing twin, uh, trends. And when I first graduated, we didn't have a whole lot, and we used a ton of chloramphenicol. And then it almost went away. It's like everybody was scared to death of it. And now we're starting to come back. And it's that middle ground. It has its place in the dog, not the cat. The cat, again, won't tolerate chloramphenicol very well. But um, it's, a, it's a really good choice here for four quadrant. Um, <clears throat> Pretofloxacin, remember your regular fluoroquinolones are not four quadrant. You have to add to them. But Pretofloxacin is a, uh, a third generation uh, or extended generation fluoroquinolone that gets streps and anaerobes. So in the cat, uh, it's a good choice. So those are probably the common single agent uh, for quadrant coverage. Now, these uh, are good for quadrant coverages and good in the sense that they have a higher probability of susceptibility than the prior slide, okay? Really good uh, sensitivity uh, for a lot of pathogens against these. Uh, and um, the drawback is they're injectable and they're expensive, okay? And of these three, uh, all of them would be good choices. We tend to reserve them more for the more serious infections based on culture and susceptibility, or if we're using them empirically, we're using them in the more life-threatening, more severe infections, okay? Now, truthfully, I wish we would use more Tymentin and more Zosin, but what we're doing is we're using more Merum, Meropenem. Uh, the reason is Meropenem, uh, being a carbapenem, has uh, better activity. There are things that it gets that the other two don't. And almost regrettably, it's cheaper than the other two. At least here it is. Uh, meropenem has gone generic, so we can get it cheaper than we can the other. The reason I say regrettably in this is, again, I'm really concerned we're overusing meropenem and we're going to create um, carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae like they have in human medicine. So when I can, I try to point clinicians uh, toward other things and reserve the meropenem for the worst case scenarios. But if I have to be right, then meropenem is a good choice. Now, um, probably more common than single agent, though, is combination therapy toward four quadrant, okay? This is probably the least used. You'll see this used more in equine, uh, but I mention it because it can work. Uh, you've got your trimethoprim sulfa, and because we use so little trimethoprim sulfa, Remember the five different uh, toxicities or side effects that TMS causes in dogs? I hope you do, because you're going to see it on, <laughs> on Thursday. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, we don't use as much of it. So we have pretty good um, percentage uh, susceptibility against these things, but we don't get our anaerobes. TMS works in vitro, but not in vivo. So we add a penicillin to pick that up. Still won't get your B for jealous, though. Uh, but that's an option, but usually not in uh, small animals. 
Here are your big combos uh, in small animals for four quadrant cover. You're going to use a lot of these. All right. When you get down to internal medicine, this is probably what you're going to respond with when they ask you what antibiotics to use. Now, while you were, that's in your senior year. When you're in your junior year, if you're in surgery, say, say cefazolin. If you're in community practice, say clavamox, and you'll probably be fine, okay? But when you get into internal medicine, more challenging cases, then one of these combos. And what you're seeing here is, is the drug up here and what it covers. And the shading is to note overlap, all right? So a fluoroquinolone or an aminoglycoside, not both, but one or the other, is going to get E. coli, pasteurella, and staph. And your amoxicillin or penicillin G may overlap some, especially on your pasteurella, not so much your staph. Metronidazole is going to get your anaerobes and your B. fragilis, which overlaps here. By the way, it took me about three hours to color code this thing, <laughs> so, so I hope you appreciate it. Trying to figure out how to make patterns and gradients and that sort of thing. All right. So fluoroquinolone and a beta-lactam, and especially if you're concerned about uh, septic peritonitis, pleuritis, where you might have fecal contamination, then metronidazole is an excellent addition, so a three-way. I, I, I pay attention to some of the medical shows, and this is a very common combo you see, like on, uh, when ER was on, and um, um, oh, the one with McDreamy and all that. Uh, they'll, they'll commonly, you know, rattle off these three uh, uh, types of drugs. Um, now, because you've got some uh, beta-lactamase production here, an alternative, this is probably more commonly used in small animal than this upper. And that's, again, a fluoroquinolone or aminoglycoside in any of these three. We see a lot of fluoroquinolone unison fluoroquinolone, clindamycin, and if unison's not available, we'll use sufoxidin. All right, so these are going to get all of these E. coli's, your enterics, your non-enteric gram negatives, your staph, whereas this group is going to get your streps and your anaerobes and your B. fragilis. Notice the little asterisk here that there are some problems with resistance of B. fragilis to the lincosamides. All right, so, uh, <coughs> um, now, probably fluoroquinolone is what you're going to tell your internal medicine clinician, but uh, I am increasingly concerned about resistance to the fluoroquinolones. I just got some uh, lab data for the last two years, and I'm in the process of uh, analyzing it, but it looks like, for example, E. coli, about 30% of them are resistant to fluoroquinolones, which is not an insubstantial uh, number. So in life-threatening emergencies, I tend to go toward uh, aminoglycoside combos rather than fluoroquinolone combos. Uh, <coughs> So uh, bear that in mind. Either, either aminoglycoside combo or meropenem are my two big choices when I really, really need to be right. Okay. So that's uh, four quadrant. Any questions about four quadrant? Yes. What do you do in the practice if like, you want to do a call sensitivity? So do you just pick one that you think is going to work, then do your call sensitivity, and then switch the drug like the next day and have it come back? That's a good question. Uh, what do you do in terms of timing of your empiric therapy versus your culture? Uh, try to always get your culture before you give antibiotics. One of the problems we run into with referral cases here is they've been on antibiotics, and when they're either on antibiotics or have been recently, in the last one to two days, it decreases the probability your culture will grow something. Uh, so try to get a culture uh, before you begin antibiotics if you, if you can. Now, I, I'm not addressing this here, but one of the things I'll do in, in that regard, if they have been on antibiotics, 
they make a thing called an antimicrobial removal device, which is really a blood culture bottle, blood culture media with a resin that binds antibiotics. And it's approved for, for obviously for blood culture in humans and to bind antibiotics and improve culture results. But I'll use it also for um, uh, peritonitis fluid, pleural fluid, that sort of thing, to bind uh, any antibiotics already there. But uh, yes, uh, take your culture, go ahead and make your best selection, put them on it, and then adjust based on the culture you get back. One of the things uh, I'll mention when I come to urinary, or I'll go ahead and say it now, one of the things I commonly do is I take my urine culture, put them on about four to five days of my best antibiotic, and by that time I have my culture and sensitivity results back, and I can switch antibiotics if I want to, and, and they don't have three weeks of clavamox that isn't going to work that they purchase. Uh, now that requires a compliant owner who's willing to call you back and, and come get the new drug. Uh, the risk of that is the non-compliant owner that takes the four days and stops and you never hear from them. But yeah, I tend to, to uh, give them enough drug to get past the culture and susceptibility results and then either continue or switch based on those results. Anything else? So you say it's okay to hit it with a bigger gun initially? Initially. Exactly. So, so when we don't know what it is and we, we suspect that we need four quadrant, we usually do go with, I hate to say big guns, but yeah, things that uh, have a high probability of working. And the more serious the disease, the more uh, I go toward those that have a really high percentage again, the carbapenems, the amino glycoside combos, that sort of thing. Probably routinely, though, it's a fluoroquinolone beta-lactam combo uh, that you'll use. Uh, 